So, without further delay, I would like to uh, ask the uh, first speaker, Mike Taylor, and he has 10 minutes to really what our advice on open by the vote from the Thank you. Well, it's very gracious of you all to hold this conference in English. I deeply appreciate it. Uh, should science always be open is our question. I want to open with uh, one of the greatest scientists that's ever been, uh, Isaac Newton, who humility didn't come naturally to him. But he did manage to say this brilliant, humble thing. If I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And the reason I love this quote is not just because it's inside there himself, but because he stole it from uh, something John Salisbury said right back in 1159. Bernard of Chartres used to say that we were like dwarves seated on the shoulders of giants if we see more and further than they. It's not due to our unclear eyes or tall bodies, but because we are raised on high and up by their gigantic bigness. Well, so Newton, I say he stole this quote, but of course he did more than that. He improved it. The original is long-winded, it goes around the houses, but Newton took that, and from that he made something better and more memorable. So in doing that, he was in fact standing on the shoulders of giants and seeing further. Um, and this is consistently where progress comes from. It's very rare that someone who's locked in the room on his own thinking about something will have a great insight. It's always about a free exchange of ideas. And we see this happening in lots of different fields. Uh, over the last 10, 15 years, enormous advances in the kinds of things computers, the working in networks can do. And that's come from the culture of openness in APIs and protocols and Silicon Valley and elsewhere where these things are designed. Uh, going back further in a completely different field, the Impressionist painters of Paris uh, lived in a, a, a community where they were constantly not exactly working together, but certainly nicking each other's ideas, improving each other's techniques, feeding back into the, this developing sense of what could be done, uh, and resulting in some fantastic art. And looking back yet further, uh, Florence in the Renaissance was at the seat of all sorts of advances in the arts and the sciences. And again, because of this culture of many minds working together uh, and yielding insights and creativity that would not have been possible with any one of them. And this is because of network effects, or Metcalfe's law expresses this by saying that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of nodes in that network. So in terms of scientific research, what that means is if you have a, a corpus of published research outputs of papers, then the value of that goes, it doesn't just increase with the number of papers, but it goes up with the square of the number of papers. Because the value isn't so much in the individual bits of research, but in the connections between them. Um, that's where great ideas come from. One researcher will read one paper from here, one from here, see where the connection or the contradiction is, and from that comes a new idea. So it's very important to increase the size of the network of what's available. And that's why we have a very natural tendency, I think, from scientists particularly, but I think we can say researchers in other areas as well, a natural tendency to share. Now until recently, the big difficulty we've had with sharing has been logistical. It was just difficult to make and distribute copies of pieces of research. Um, so this is how we made copies. Uh, this was what we stored them on. And uh, this is how we transmitted them from one researcher to another. And they were not the most efficient means, or at least not as efficient as what we now have available. Uh, and because of that, and because of the importance of communication and the links between research, I would argue that maybe the most important invention of the last hundred years is the internet in general, and the World Wide Web in particular. And the purpose of the web was initially articulated in the uh, first public post that Tim Berners-Lee made in 1991. He explained not just what the word was, but what it was for, and he said, the project started with the philosophy that much academic information should be freely available to anyone. It aims to allow information sharing with international and dispersed teams and the dissemination of information by support groups. So that's what the web is for, and here is why it's important, and I'm quoting here from Cameron Naylor, who's great on this kind of thing. And again, it comes down to connections, and I'm just going to read out loud from this blog. Like all developments of new communication networks, SMS, fixed telephones, telegraph, railways, and writing itself, the internet doesn't just change how well we can do things, it qualitatively changes what we can do. And then later on, the same post. 
At network scale, the system ensures that resources get used in unexpected ways. At scale, you can have serendipity by design, not by blind luck. Now, that's a paradox, it's almost a contradiction, isn't it? Serendipity, by definition, is what you get by blind luck. But the point is when you have enough connections, enough papers floating around from the same open ecosystem, all the collisions happening between them, it's inevitable that you're going to get interesting things coming out. And that's what we're aiming towards. Uh, and of course, it's never been more important with um, health crises, new diseases, uh, the diminishing effectiveness of antibiotics, the difficulties of feeding a world of many millions of people, and the results of climate change. It's not as though we're short of significant problems to, to deal with. So, I love this John Foley quote. He said, your job is, as a researcher, your job is not to get tenure. Your job is to change the world. Tenure is the means to an end. It's not what you're there for. So this is the importance of publishing. So of course, the word publish comes from the same root as the word public. To publish a piece of research means to make that piece of research public. And the purpose of publishing is to open research up to the world, and so open up the world itself. And that's why it's so tragic when we run into this. I think we've all seen this at various times. You go to read a piece of research that puts value, uh, that's relevant to either the research you're doing or the, the job you're doing in your company or whatever it might be, and you run into this table, uh, $35.95 to read this paper, um, is a disaster because what's happened is um, we've got a whole industry whose existence is to make things public and who, because of accidents of history, have found themselves doing the exact opposite. Now, no one goes into publishing with the intent of doing this, but this is the unfortunate outcome. So what we end up with is a situation where we're reimposing on the research community. Barriers that were necessarily imposed by the inadequate technology 20 and 30 years ago, but which were now transcended in technological terms, but we're still struggling with for, frankly, commercial reasons. This is why we're struggling with this. And uh, I don't like to be critical, but I think we have to just face the fact that there is a real problem when organisations for many years have been making extremely high profits. Uh, these are the profit margins of the big four academic publishers, which together hugely dominate the scholarly publishing market. And as you can see, they're in the range 32% of 42% of their revenue is sheer profit. So every time the University Library spends a dollar on subscriptions, 40% of that goes straight out of the system to nowhere. And it's not surprising that these companies are hanging on desperately to the business model that allows them to do that. Now, the problem we have in advocating for open access is that when we stand against the publishers who have an existing very profitable business model, they can complain to governments and say, look, we have a, a market that's, that's economically significant, it's worth somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 billion US dollars a year. And they will say to governments, uh, you shouldn't do anything that might damage this. And that sounds effective. Um, and we struggle to argue against that because we're talking about an opportunity cost, which is so much harder to measure. You know, I can stand here as I have done and wave my hands around and talk about innovation and opportunity and networks and connections. Um, but it's very hard to quantify it in a way that can be persuasive to people in a numeric way and say, you know, they have a $15 million business, we're talking about saving three trillions worth of economic values. So I'm not pulled that number out of thin air. So I would love, if we can, we'll get to the discussions to brainstorm some ways of quantifying the opportunity cost of not being open. Uh, but this is what it looks like. You know, economically, I don't know what it's worth. But in, uh, in terms of the world we live in, it is just essential. So we've got to remember the mission that we're on. We're not just trying to save costs by going to open access publishing. We're trying to transform what research is and what it's for. So should science always be open? Of course, the name of the session should have been, of course, science should always be open.